roll like four times a week or something but mm -hmm. that's um, quite a bit mm -hmm, but i've been focusing so much more on my stand-up and on my wrestling Hell so yeah. like right now i'm wrestling four times a week and that's a lot of like energy you know yeah and then uh, i do i spar like four times a week usually but it's not like hard hard sparring mm -hmm. but i'll go do like is it usually with a group of girls no, it's usually with guys. With guys, smaller mm -hmm. guys. So, uh, I, I work with one guy that's like a 55er or a, or a welterweight somewhere in there. He walks around at like 180, 185. Uh -huh. But he's such a good partner. Um, I did my whole camp for Roxanne with him. His oh, name, really? Yeah, and he would come to... So we have like a mat room in my house. And he would uh, come and like... We did all through all of quarantine we did the whole camp for roxanne just me and him damn and, and we'd do privates with joe i sparred with just him uh yeah so and and that was a really good fight so we actually killed at that fight camp and both of us got a Fuck lot better because yeah. all the gyms were closed so yeah i was wondering how your training was going for that yeah it's really good so and then even though the gyms were closed in texas they're like fuck you <laughs> don't tell us what to do so a lot of gyms kind of stayed open just kind of on the underground because like, is texas a little bit more like hick that way or they're just really conservative. They don't want government fucking with their shit at all. Uh, it's a lot of like really, they're a lot of gun owners, um, big on Second Amendment rights. R they want small government. A lot of people, it reminds me of Alaska because a lot of people just want to be left alone. They want right. to do their thing. They don't fucking want anybody telling them what to do. They've lived that way for a long time. And uh, like personal accountability and responsibility is just a big deal there. They don't think it needs to be legislated. Yeah. So, Hell people yeah. don't, people are not big on wearing masks. Like, um, a lot of the businesses that were supposed to shut down didn't, like a lot of bars and restaurants and stuff. Some of them got in big trouble and it would go to court and like all of Texas was like, fuck yeah, you fuck Damn. the man. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've heard one person that moved to Texas say they, I don't like it, fucking hate it. Is it just a sweet place to live or it's what? It's fucking awesome. The weather is good, first of all. Like, that's awesome. Um, Southern hospitality is a real thing. When you meet a teenager in Texas, they call you sir and ma'am. Really? For sure, 100%. It's yes, ma'am, <laughs> no, sir. They're very polite. Um, and they're, they're fucking raised that way. And mm. um, what else is great about Texas? I think there's, like, no income tax. Uh, there's, Dude. Yeah. Um, like, income tax. Because I'm barely learning about taxes and all the taxes of my business like because i didn't know there was a fucking thing called called a transaction privilege tax have you ever heard about that never heard of it. it it was six grand i had to pay today for transaction privilege tax i was like is it to like ring stuff up at your gym i i think so i think it's for sales tax, sales tax. Oh, okay sales okay. tax but six grand that's I was like, crazy what yeah. How do people even fucking survive? Well, dude, and then they, like, kick you in the ass with it, like, at the end of the line. Like, February comes around, and they're like, oh, it's tax time? Well, let me tell you what you owe. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking fuck, about? Dude. I know. Are you pretty... I know. It's really important, I think, to have, like, somebody year-round that knows what they're doing, because then they can be like... Like, we have a, an accountant now, and he's like, we're paying ourselves, like, from my business account, you know? Uh -huh. And so we had to, like, how much do we pay ourselves? And he, oh, he broke you, it man. all down. He's like, man, if you pay yourself this much, you. then your taxes at the end of the year are going to be this much, and your income is going to look like this. So this is the amount I suggest monthly to pay yourself. I'm like, good fucking thing that guy's here, because otherwise we would have just paid ourselves whatever. And yeah. then it fucks with your taxes at the end of the year. So. Oh, I know. I'm like, what the fuck? Are you pretty good at when you get in those big chunks of money from, like, your wins and stuff, putting it aside? What do you do? Just put a chunk of money aside or what? Yeah, I have an LLC now. Oh, okay. So I have, like, a business that I set up, and uh, it all goes – all all the money I earn goes to the LLC, and then the LLC pays me. Yeah. And then I pay my coaches out of that. Um, like, guys like Andy Galpin and mm -hmm. Mateo, they all get paid out of that. Any business expense comes out of it now, but we just started that this year because this is the first year I started really making money. Yeah. Well, last year, I guess, 2020. Well, tell them, right. I was like, how many people do you think say fuck taxes and just fuck themselves? Oh, fucking a lot. A lot of people go, that's my tax bill. I'll pay it later. You it, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, let me give you an IOU or they just fucking ignore it. And they then don't even do it. The, it's so overwhelming and like writing yep. everything down and keeping track of everything. Is yeah. Like, yeah, they don't even report anything. They just don't even fuck with it. And then five years later, the IRS is like, hey, motherfucker, you owe us half a million dollars. Ooh. You know, I know. And you're like, what the fuck? And then they're like, well, we'll take a payment plan, but there's interest. So yeah. it's just, yeah. it's fucking crazy. But I mean. If you get money back, then they don't give that to you. But if you owe money, yeah. you still owe it. You still owe it. I know. And then anything you get through the government, like a stimulus mm -hmm. check or a tax return, that all goes right straight to them and you don't even get your hands on it. So, so what, uh, what was, what's your usually smoking uh, routine through fight camp? Man, uh, I try to knock it off 
like a month out, like four weeks out, five Cold weeks turkey out. Cold turkey quit. I try, but it is hard for me. You yeah. Know? Like I just have one of those personalities where if I like something and it feels good, I'm taking it. I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah, I'm doing it. And, and I'm pretty spoiled, honestly, since we moved to Texas. Like, you know, Joe, he doesn't tell me no a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so he's just a good guy. Yeah. And, uh, and honestly, marijuana just, it fucking helps. Like it helps my mindset a lot. It helps me see things a little bit differently. It keeps me in a better frame of mind a lot. And so it's kind of trying to weigh out like, okay, uh, if ment if mentally it's good for me, yeah, it, but I do need to stop for a fight. Like it's probably not good for my cardio. You know, I don't think it's great for my weight either, just because of the munchies. Do you and feel stuff. like when you're vaporizing, it affects your cardio? It's hard for me to say because I feel like I have great cardio. Yeah, I feel like my cardio is really good. I yeah, have cardio yeah. a lot of my opponents, and um, I think some of that is just because I work so hard. Mm -hmm. So I know there's a lot of high level UFC fighters that yeah. smoke weed that have amazing cardio. Yeah. You know, and I think it really does come down to like, are you training your cardio in the right way? You mm -hmm. know? So I, I don't know. For me personally, the effect might be minimal, but I would hate to think that I lost a fight because I didn't quit smoking yeah. weed. You know, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that yeah. would really, really fucking bother me. So because do you ever smoke and stuff before practice? Before jujitsu practice, for sure I will. Or if it's going to be like a light practice or something then yeah. yeah but as it gets more serious in camp and i need to like take more care then no i'll yeah. wait till after plus i like i like working out hard sober and then getting high afterward oh, like and sure. then like relaxing nothing it, better it really helps me sleep too like when i stop smoking weed i go through a period for sure where mm -hmm. i don't sleep very well and in camp that is super super important get your rest for get real. your z's for real because how many hours a night you usually get of sleep Nine? like six really yeah and it's bad i don't like it when i get eight i feel like on what do you fire. do for, what, for six hours like what time you go to bed what time you wake up uh it, honestly it kind of doesn't matter what time i go to bed i wake up about six hours later and the trick for me is going huh. back to sleep without like getting uh without getting up but a lot of times like i'm getting old so I, like i hurt a lot i'll wake up because i'm in pain literally you're 30 37 baby Damn. i know and then, and That's then badass. Uh, yeah and then uh if i don't eat right this is so crazy but if i don't eat right i'll wake up and i have to shit at like mm -hmm. four in the morning and so i'm like you know what i have to eat really well mm -hmm. so that i can sleep yeah. and i have to sleep really well so i can have great workouts and mm -hmm. i have to have great workout so i could win these fucking fights it was really like this big domino effect but yeah diet and sleep just play a huge 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 part yeah that's fucking awesome because i okay when's the first fight i went with you was it pittsburgh i think it was pittsburgh i wish i'd taken you with me a lot sooner <laughs> was it pittsburgh to, uh pittsburgh to fight not it wasn't sajara uh, kelly fashels that's right that's right <laughs> yeah <laughs> which was a fucking sweet fight it was awesome but god what changed for you like because even when you were training here, you were seen as sports psychologist, and you're, you're always been super intelligent about that stuff and read books and, like, super smart about it. But something obviously changed once you left. Big time. Once you left. <clears throat> what was it? I think it was my confidence was probably the number one thing, honestly. Yeah. Um, when I moved to Texas, so I had a coach out there that I had already worked with before I ever even moved to the lab, and he had done five fights with me. He Four? maybe four fights, but he took me through Invicta. I won the Invicta championship with him. Mm -hmm. And um, he was just such a cool guy. He has five black belts. His name is Alex C's name. Mm -hmm. He has a really small like roster of fighters, really small stable. And uh, he was just always a super kind coach, very level-headed. He's very stoic. He's, mm -hmm. He doesn't get emotional. And then um, I met Bob Perez in 2019. I went to go train with Montana De La Rosa. Mm -hmm. And I met Bob Perez. And he is hysterical. He's Derek Lewis's coach. Uh -huh. He has like the handlebar mustache. Yeah, I know he's, that guy. Yeah, he's fucking cool. And he's a really good striking coach. And That's awesome. So working with them, they really respect me. They treat me with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. Like they, it was a stark contrast, Yeah, <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, they treat me with a lot of respect. They believe in me. Like they've just always told me like, this is, you're so strong. You hit very hard. Mm -hmm. And then they're not afraid to tell me like, you need to work in these areas. Like, and then they say, let's do it. And here's how we're going to do it. Yeah. And I love that. It makes me feel like I'm really accomplishing stuff. Yeah. Every time I go into a fight, I feel like, man, I've gotten so much better. Uh, these guys believe in me. They set me up with uh, training partners that are going to emulate my next opponent. They're really good at game planning, which yeah. has really changed the game for me. Because um, I am the kind of athlete, if you give me a job, you tell me what to do, do I'm going to do it. Yeah, it sure. We're going to find a way to get it mm -hmm. done. If you tell me to be creative and find 
a new move to do or like some new jujitsu sequence, I'm like, I no. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. like, that's not me. I am the kind of person yeah. though where you tell me to do it, I'm like, okay, fuck, suit up, let's get it done. Dude, well, I forgot who said it, but I, I've always thought it too. The most, 100% the most important thing going into a fist fight is your confidence. And even, I was telling Sean the other, other week, I was like, dude, you could be fighting a hillbilly from Montana with the shittiest training or a kid from that's trained at TriStar who's a good athlete but questions himself. And when things get hard, he'll find a way out. And the hillbilly's going to beat him up yeah. just because of his confidence. That You see it all the time in MMA. You see guys that should not win a fight. They, You know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, that guy is not very technical. He's not very good, but... I'll be damned. They just find a way to pull it out because they're not afraid to try. Yeah. And they believe in themselves and they're not going to quit. And they, you know, they always feel like, like, even they get beat up two rounds, they think like, oh, this third one, I got this. I can change this. I yep. can turn this around for myself. Like a, almost one of the best people that have it is like Bam Bam, you know? Yeah. He's just a tough one. That Bam, uh, Brian Barberina, he could train 40, he could go on a run 45 minutes every day for a fight camp, go into a UFC <laughs> fight, be like, I'm going to fuck this guy up and truly believe it too. Yeah. Yeah. And just in my own like experience, like I remember what it was like fighting in Invicta and just not being afraid to try, not really caring if I mm -hmm. won or lost um, and not feeling like it said anything about me as a person. And then that kind of changed for a while. And I really, um, I felt like man, nothing I do works. Like yeah. I'm not good at this. And so I would go into a fight and I would want to do something like throw a simple jab cross. But in my mind, I'd be like, it's not going to work. This isn't going to work. And yeah. it, you know, it's based on having experiences for months prior where mm -hmm. it didn't work. Yeah. And so that's another big thing is I have a lot of success in practice now, which is nice. I practice success. And then mm -hmm. when I go to the fight, like I have practiced being successful and that practice translates to, you know, Yeah, going that's live. fucking nice. Well, so. always, every time I've cornered you or even like helped you during your fight camp stuff. I've always noticed how tough you are. <laughs> Thanks, like you overthink man. <laughs> everything. Like used to overthink kind of everything. Be like, ah, but like, dude, you are so tough. This bitch isn't gonna rock you. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you've ever been <laughs> fucking rocked. But where I, I want to know, like, because probably not a lot of people know like your story and what what age you started jujitsu and what kind of where you got that mentality from to fight and to be super tough. Where did it come from, almost? I don't know. I've always been tough, honestly. Like from since, what age? As long as I can remember. Really? Really, like were, even were you a tomboy a little mm -hmm. bit? Yeah, I always hung out with boys, and then even when I was little, I remember clearly like wrestling with my brother uh, when we were kids, and I remember adults commenting on like how tough I was, and I, I uh -huh. must have only been seven or eight, you know. Hmm. Um, I remember um, just liking to like kind of scrap around when I was a kid. I liked to mm -hmm. wrestle. I liked to like be strong. I've always been physically strong for my size yeah. and every you know size and age everything and um like at, at recess and stuff i remember like playing like this weird form of rugby like it was just us all trying to like knock each other yeah. down shove each other tackle each other there were no real rules but i just remember doing stuff like that my whole childhood and liking it and um want i wanted to be tough like yeah. i watched like fight you know fighting movies growing up like kickboxer and all that shit and i wanted to be like that yeah but i don't i don't think i ever made a choice to be tough but then so what did you get at what age did you get surrounded by the wrong group of people like how did you start doing like drugs probably like like 14 like i was a pretty straight edge kid and i was smart i liked going to school i was like a good student for a really long time mm -hmm. and then my dad died when i was 11 and that kind of like not kind of it really rocked me a lot mm -hmm. and then um i went into junior high and i was just a fucking weird kid <laughs> in junior high. i was fucked up you mm -hmm. know um i didn't know how to talk to people i lost a lot of confidence i think when my dad died i looked at the ground a lot i got i got picked on quite a bit because of that and because i was like i made myself an easy target like i dressed kind of weird mm -hmm. i talked like i was just kind of i didn't know how, yeah it was awkward yeah that's a good word for it and so i got made fun of a lot uh, especially like through junior high. And then my first year of high school, ninth grade, um, I got a boyfriend. Um, that was pretty cool. He smoked cigarettes. And, and that was at 14 years yeah, old? Yeah, I was 14. And, and how old was he? Probably? Yeah, he's like 15 or 16. Smoking ciggies like too. Smoking cigarettes out uh, at the tunnels, like outside the school grounds, uh, you know. And then uh, I started smoking pot. And it, for me, it helped me get friends. Like 
I yeah. could go smoke weed with people, drop acid, take mushrooms. And there was another group of people that accepted me and we mm -hmm. did all that together. And I was good at it. I was good at doing drugs. Like I could like hold my own. I could get really fucked up and like- Not freak out. Not freak out. Uh, I, I used to like play this game. Like I'd get really fucked up like on whatever it was. And then I would go out and do my thing and just see if anybody would notice. Damn. And it was like, it was like <laughs> me trying to like- uh, With yourself. Oh yeah, it was just a game with myself. <laughs> I get cool, as though. fucked up as possible and then like try- On and different shit like LSD? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, anything like I Damn. anything. So yeah, and then as I got older, the drugs got harder and harder. And so I think when I was like, when I was like seventeen, I got pregnant, and I had a really hard time like like being sober. So I went to a twelve step program, which I actually really enjoyed. Because um, so when was the when did you take your first like hit of heroin or meth or whatever it was when was the first hit like oh shit this is a hard shit i'm gonna try it uh like i remember doing some stuff when i was 15 like it just like, came around you yeah and your buddies. it just came around like yeah. there we'd go like uh get drunk with somebody and they would pull something out or i'd be like with a friend and they'd be like dude come meet this guy we're going to his house like he's mm -hmm. got all this shit i'd be like okay cool you Fuck know it, and go yeah. like t tag along and there'd be some dude there with like pills or coke or whatever yeah and then like on the weekends you go out with your friends and so do you remember it vividly hitting like the first thing heroin how it made you feel no i did a lot i did mostly pills i did like oxycotton when i got older so ap after uh, max was born i started using again and that's when it really took off and got got really bad because then i was i you know i was like 17 18 and i had my own apartment um, there was a big settlement from when my dad died, and so I had a bunch of money. When you turn eighteen, you get mm -hmm. the money. Yeah, Damn. I know it was bad, and so. And so then, how much money did you get at eighteen? They had me fifty grand. And you're sitting there eighteen. Eighteen years old. I was like fucking. I thought I was rich. I literally I'm, was like, I could buy a house. I could go to college. Fucking ball. And now I see fifty grand, and I'm like, fuck, you better save that shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that'll but, go like that. Huh? But yeah, they and then so they gave me all this money, and I had this like Max's dad was like, uh, he was like a punk rocker. It was yeah. cool to him to like not work. He was was he like, living with you at the time? Oh in that yeah, apartment? living off of me. Yeah, living with me. Like, Eighteen, and you got fifty grand in the bank. Yeah. And, and at that time, were you doing the drugs? Yes. Fuck. I what know. a mess. That's why I'm like, I'm kind of lucky to be alive because, like, Fuck, I really yeah. felt like king shit. You know what I mean? I was like big fish in a small pond, <laughs> like living yeah. in Eagle River, Alaska, in a shitty little apartment. I felt like I was like queen of the world. Balling. You know? Would you have parties there and shit? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and the whole apartment complex I lived in was a bunch of kids like me. Not uh -huh. not with the money, but. Um, there was like a group of like 10 of us that just Damn. got high together, used together, old enough to kind of sign for your own stuff. And so like they would get an apartment, all eight of them would live there. When they get evicted, they'd like mm -hmm. rent another apartment in the same building under somebody else's name. So they, would you, you know, buy like for the whole party, would you buy shit for like drinks and stuff? Or were you Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It was more like I would go buy like a couple grams of coke or something yeah. and then people just flock to you and you oh, do stuff yeah. like that and fuck so yeah. it would be more like that or like i would buy pills and you got to buy it through somebody mm -hmm. so of course like then somebody knows what you're buying and how much of it and so then so how quick did that 50 grand run out <sighs> Quick, quick. And I remember the day I like looked at my bank account and it was so much lower than I thought it was going to be. You know, you spend money, you don't even realize yeah. you're spending it. I had like a checkbook. So I'm like writing checks left and right. Yeah. And, and I remember freaking out and like yelling at my kid's dad and being like, you said you would get a fucking job. Like you said you would fucking help me. Like you haven't done shit, you know? And so was that around 21 or 20? No, I was still 18. <laughs> what are you talking That 50 grand lasted like a month. Dude, I, I, I think crazy? that was a fun month though. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, I had a job delivering pizzas and i loved it like because mm -hmm. I, I drove around all the time i could just smoke weed and drive around deliver pizzas i make cash every night i drive like a maniac so mm -hmm. i was like pretty fast you know yeah. so yeah i made like tips and cash and so then from 18 to how old because before you started jujitsu you started jujitsu at what age i was like 27 mm -hmm. so from 18 to 27 what was ever, your life like i had a period there of like five years of sobriety in there so like like 21 i basically hit rock bottom i was like in and out of the hospital i was iv using so i was using a lot of needles and that leads to stuff like abscesses and infections and so you just um, hitting the wrong vein or missing the vein it just gets what? infected you're t literally taking like a needle and sticking it in your skin like however many times a day 20 same needle no, hopefully not. Uh, addicts will, but hopefully not. Hopefully <laughs> Fuck, you used to be able dude. to get a box of hypodermic needles from mm -hmm. like, I think you still can, like, you know, guys get them to drain their ears yeah. and stuff. 
Um, and so, yeah, you could just go and be like, hey, I'd like a box of hypodermic needles. They'll give you like 50 of them or whatever. It's like eight bucks. So then you get those fucking infections. Because how many times would you usually stick yourself a day on a day where it was bad? Oh, I fucking couldn't even tell you. Like five. It depends on how much drugs you have. And honestly. then you just hit it. You know, and Oof. it's like, you don't want to waste the needles you have, but you don't want to reuse them too much either. So, yeah. it's, I mean, it's it's a gross, it's a fucking disgusting way to live. It's you had disgusting. to go to the hospital for infection zone shit? Yeah, like, um, like... I had like abscesses in my arms and, and it's an infection in your skin. So you have to take antibiotics for it and stuff, but I didn't even know what it was. And uh. so I, my friends took me to the hospital one time, for, I think twice for abscesses and one time because I OD'd and I OD'd pretty bad. Like I had a seizure and uh, uh, like damn. fell out and so they called it, you know, they had to call an ambulance and like, just fucking drooling there sitting there. Well, by the t so I had the seizure in my truck. I had a truck that I bought with fifty thousand yeah. dollars, so that's like half of it right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I had a truck, and I was getting high with a girl, and she's actually dead now. She's been dead a long time, but um, we were we were shooting up, and the last thing I remember was being like, "Man, I need some air. If I could just." roll down my window I could get some air and mm -hmm. I was sitting in the driver's seat and then the next thing I remember I looked over and she was like staring at me mouth open mm -hmm. eyes wide and I was like mad I was like what the fuck are you looking at what is your problem with your ass beat bitch yeah I know exactly I was like, what the <laughs> fuck I was 21 I think or 20 and uh, she goes man you had a seizure and you hit your head on the horn she goes we gotta go the cops might come Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay. And I just put my truck in gear and I drove her home. And then I drove to my friend's house and I told them what happened. And they were like, fuck, you need to go to the hospital. Like you could have another one, like anything yeah. could happen. And I called my mom, I was crying. And I was like, like, I think I OD'd and I don't know what to do. And so anyway, I went to the hospital, they called an ambulance and I rode by ambulance, which today I probably wouldn't do that. I'd be like, no fucking, I'll drive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, I, w I went to the hospital and just um I, I was like fuck like really didn't want to be where i was i didn't want to get high any like i didn't want to use coke anymore i didn't want to take any more pills i wanted to be a good mom and like a good i was a shitty person because how old was max at that time he would have been three mm -hmm. something yeah i think three it was before he was in school for sure so anyway i ended up going to a bunch of rehabs and um my mom like let me live with her which was really cool of her. what was the longest rehabs i stayed in rehab for like like i went to like three or four different rehabs over the course of like two years and i think i stayed in one rehab for like nine months what the hell would you do every day or that fuck they have, there's all different kinds of programs some of them will send you to work like outside of the uh -huh. program and then you go sleep there at night um some of them have you all fucking live together and you just like run the basically you run the rehab program that you're in and so i was in one of those it's called like a therapeutic community so mm -hmm. i was in that for like nine months but i never stayed sober in a but, well you were around all the other druggies dude, you're like the, fuck let's just sneak <laughs> off this is like what i have come to believe is that if you want drugs or alcohol the best place to find it is with an addict and the fucking best place to find an addict is in a rehab center they're uh -huh. chock full of them you know <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> and everybody like everybody's on the struggle in one yeah. of those places and it really doesn't take much it takes one fucking person to go hey man i got some pills you know or like let's go hey, yeah let's go or like hey man i'm fucking getting this work pass what do you think we could you know yeah and so yeah it's it's really full of places like that so anyway i called my mom and i was like i'll if you let me like stay with you, I said, I'll go back to a 12 step program. And she was, she was like, okay. And so I did that. And I actually really, like I said, I really enjoyed it. I worked the steps like with a sponsor mm -hmm. for like five years. Damn. I think it did me a lot of good. It taught me a lot. It taught me like how to apologize to people when I'm wrong, which is a really valuable mm -hmm. skill. It's really served me really well. Mm -hmm. um, it taught me a lot about like accountability. It taught me in what ways I'm very selfish and self-centered, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just important stuff to recognize. Some people recognize that type of stuff, like through meditation or mushrooms yeah. or other ways. But for me, a 12 step program yeah, really we, helped me with it. Some people learn it like through religion and stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's all different ways to kind of get to that point. And um, so how old were you when you, f and why did you first stop step into a jujitsu gym? Max was like eight and I had started drinking again. So I, I stayed sober for like five years. And then when I was like 26, I was hanging out with some friends and I was like, fuck, I don't know. It's been a long time. Like maybe I just really overreacted, you know, yeah. like I want to get drunk. And so I started drinking and kind of went off. It just went off the rails really badly, pretty quick. But I was like 26, I think. And Max was eight at this time. And so um, I was like, man, remember those movies like Kickboxer and stuff? Like I always wanted to try that, but mm -hmm. never did. I said, maybe it'll do Max some good. Like, it'll give him some confidence and help him make friends. And mm -hmm. um, 
teach them like some respect and accountability and stuff. And so I literally opened the phone book and stuck my finger in and I was like, okay, Gracie Barra, like whatever the fuck yeah. that is. And I called him and I was like, well, what is it? And uh, the lady said, it's really good for kids. It's like ground fighting, it's jujitsu and submissions and stuff. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I kind of wanted to like beat some fucking ass. Yeah. punch somebody. And she said, well, I understand. But she said, you know, 90% of fights end up on the ground. And I thought about that for like one second. I was like, fuck, she's right. Like, <laughs> that's so true, you know? Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll be in. And so I took Max and me and him showed up just like day one, no nothings. And mm -hmm. um, he did the kids class, which he hated, by the yeah. way. <laughs> and then, and I did the adults class and I loved it. There were other girls in there that were also white and Max belts. just hang out while you did the I can't remember adult what did. class, yeah. Yeah, we, tri we tried to take him for a while, like a couple times, especially since I had started really falling in love yeah. with it. And he just, like, he was literally like, Mom, they're all touching me. Oh, so, like. <laughs> so first day, did you go live? Uh, probably. I, I remember learning, like, um, a couple things, like, very early on as a white belt. And I remember there were two or three other white belt women there. And we would, we would, like, drill it the best we could. And then one of us would be like, okay, now I'm going to give you some resistance. I'm going to fight with you a little bit. And we'd be like, okay. And we, like, I don't know, kind of go live, yeah. you know, the best we could. And I, I rolled with uh, some of the people there. And they all told me, like, you're tough, you're strong, you're going to be good, you know, even mm -hmm. as a white belt, people were telling me that. So, yeah that helps I think keep your interest in something if they had been like nah maybe not for you <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have fallen in love with it but how long did you train then at that gym before you had your first fight I started training jujitsu like in November of 2009 and then I started training like with the MMA team the next spring of 2010 and mm -hmm. I took my first MMA fight it was a pro fight I took it in June so you had about two a year and a half of training before about Six months. Oh, six months. I had six months, yeah. God, that's what's nice about like Alaska and Montana. Six months, you can just fight, get some you experience. Fight, get some experience. Get Feel the emotions of a fist fight and be mm -hmm. like, okay, now I can build off this. But here, it's so hard to get an amateur fight. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And in Texas, the guys run into that too. Fuck, but it's like, at, at the end of the day, there's always somebody that's going to fight you. Yeah, it's, if they have shows. like If they have shows. The pandemic has really fucked that up. Fucking yeah. poor amateurs, dude. I know, it sucks. Especially like... As a female, I was super lucky at the time because there were other females in the MMA scene in Alaska that were fighting. And Hell we were yeah. all about the same weight. There was like four of us at the time. Oh, fuck yeah. And so we all fought each other. It was perfect. Fucking and we all, sweet. yeah. And none of us really had aspirations to like fight on a bigger level. So all our fights were pro, but mm -hmm. we like literally for years, I didn't know what an amateur was. Pro. So Alaska, you're just pure pro. You're straight pro. Now I think they do some amateur fights. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was 10 years ago, but yeah, 10 years ago, they were like, nope, it's going on your record. You're pro yeah. <laughs> you know because uh, they don't have a commission yeah. and so the fighters wanted to be recognized they wanted to be reported to sure dog mm -hmm. they wanted to be champions even if it was only going to be in alaska and yep. you know so anyway yeah so and i literally didn't know fills it out sends it to sure dog and then it's on your record as a fucking pro mm -hmm. yeah and mo damn. but most of those guys like now they have aspirations to go to the ufc but at the time 10 years ago it was like everybody was just having fun and yeah. fucking, fucking around at least that's what i was doing i was just fucking around i don't know yeah so what fight was it where you're like damn i could make some money doing this uh i thought I fought in Alaska. So I fought my first fight and it was 17 seconds. And I was like, well, that doesn't really fucking count. Like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, yeah. you don't really get to do anything. Mm -hmm. So then I did another fight. It went into the second round and it was so fucking fun. I was like, this is this shit. This is so fun. And even then I might have quit, except that a girl walked into the octagon and she was the champion of that promotion. And she was like, oh, you think you're fucking good? Like, you're yeah, going to, yeah. how about you fucking fight me? And uh -huh. it was an arena full of people. So of course I was like, uh, yeah, like I, <laughs> I just didn't want to look like a pussy. I literally may have never fought again, except that she did that that day. Oh, really? Yeah. And so I fought her and I beat her and I was like, oh shit, this Hell is yeah. awesome. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll just do it maybe till I lose, mm -hmm. I guess. So I did my fourth fight in Alaska. And then uh, my coach moved away. He moved to Texas, the coach that I had in Alaska. And I was like, fuck, I was kind of bummed. And then Joe was moving. He had to move to Florida with the military. And we were really sad about that because we had just started dating. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to go to Florida with Joe. Like, I'm going to move with, I'm moving with you. <laughs> I was like, you can't get rid of me. So Joe and I moved to Florida and I drove to Texas to my old coach to get my blue belt. And he gave me my blue belt. And while I was there, somebody, uh, Invicta offered me a, four fight contract oh cool and, and I then was like, so what was the pay for that like a thousand thousand maybe if that i think my i can't even remember what the contract specified mm -hmm. but um it was like a three or four fight deal at the time invicta was like really new and blowing yeah. up and i was like super honored to be so that was the first time though your money that you got offered money 
Oh no, I got paid in Alaska. Like, like I think I made like sometimes. yeah, five hundred, five hundred, probably a thousand. Which is still pretty sweet. You're like, Damn, yeah, I made a thousand like, bucks to fuck that girl. Two thousand, yeah, two thousand dollars. I'm going to the bar with tonight. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> 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 And then uh, after I met Joe, I got sober again because I was like, fuck, I want to be with him. Yeah. He, like I was a train wreck, you know, and mm. so I was winning these fights, but it was like one of them was like by the skin of my teeth just because mm. I've been using the. Well, she just happened to gas out. She oh. wasn't a great like athlete, mm -hmm. but like, yeah, it was lucky because I was also gassed. Jared Cannonier was in my corner for that fight. Oh, cool. And that fight camp, I had been like, I didn't have a car because I'd gotten a DUI. Fucking like I didn't have a way to get to the gym. Mm. I was in all this legal trouble um i had been using a bunch of speed and stuff like my entire fight camp and after that i was like fuck man like i really wanted to be with joe yeah and um yeah so anyway when i moved to florida with joe i really sobered up and like quit using quit drinking quit using everything and then invicta offered me that contract i fought for legacy too while i was in i fought for legacy while i was signed to invicta it was just like a one-off fight that they contracted me for and that was the fight it was the first televised female fight that legacy had ever done it was the oh, first time sweet. yeah it was the first time they had ever had like females on their main card Hell yeah. and i distinctly remember asking my coach like do you think i could like go somewhere with this like mm -hmm. you think i could like maybe actually like be somebody and immediately he goes yes 100 percent." and well, I at that time the ufc wasn't even having girls yet yeah they didn't so what when, when you were looking at go somewhere what were you looking at invicta champion Maybe Invicta Champion. Maybe the UFC had just started signing women. I think okay. they had just started signing women. So that's what's in your like mind a little 100%. bit. percent. Yeah, or even just like, could I win some more? Yeah. Could I like do this for a couple more years? Yeah. Like, I didn't even really know what I was talking about when I meant go somewhere. I really didn't have like aspirations to be the UFC champion until yeah. I was in the UFC. Isn't it crazy your coach saying that too? Like you could do that. Like that's what you needed to hear at that time. If he didn't say that, I wouldn't be fighting it's right so now. It's so weird that those random little things can be like, okay, he said yeah. I could do it. I can fucking do it. Yeah. And that's all I, I need. Everything he had told me up to that point had worked and come true, you know? And yeah. like, I was like, okay, if he believes in me, like he knows what he's talking about and mm -hmm. he believes in me. So. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. So now you're goddamn the number five flyweight, right? Number three. Fuck. I know. Number I know. three. <laughs> I know. That's so bad. And we're talking about title shots and like. Dude, and I felt like it was just not long ago. It was the fight after Sajara in the back. Like, I don't know if I want to do this. I was like, fuck, she seems serious. I'm mm -hmm. like, I think she oh, might retire. But yeah. you just weren't enjoying the whole process a ton. And it just, you weren't in a good fucking like headspace. Yeah. For sure, one hundred percent. I still think though, if you would have won that fight, if we only warmed up half the amount we warmed up, not even half, <laughs> a quarter of the amount we warmed up. Such a such a hard lesson to learn, but it's true. And now, now when we're in the locker room, Joe's always like, "Hey, don't forget, Same we're energy. not, yeah, yeah, we're not gonna fucking do that again." Because like the most important part is you want your fighter to feel good. So if they're asking you to do something just for themselves, be like, "Oh yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, do it." But I was like, damn, she's putting a lot of power into these mates. <laughs> and then for just for the record, so you guys know, I fought Sajara and uh, we were in the, I had a terrible weight cut and then not a very good recharge. Like I didn't have Mateo at the time. Yep. And so I didn't really know what I was doing. And so looking back, I didn't have a great like recovery from the weight cut either. And it was a horrendous weight cut. But yeah. And then in the back, it was so hot. Do you remember how hot it was in that arena? Well, usually usually for a fight, you'll wake up in the morning, get the food moving, get a nice little warm up. But we went to the cage, did a fucking half hour hard workout in the cage. <laughs> Lauren's like, no, let's go some more. Let's go some more. I'm like, okay, let's go home and or go to the room and rest for like five hours till we go to the venue. Went to the venue, had another hard fucking workout. Yeah. Dude, so at uh, UFC 247 in Houston, I shared a locker room with John Jones mm -hmm. and was there when he got to warm up. And that motherfucker warms the fuck up. He, Does he, he go hard like that? He went for two hours. Holy he shit. He sparred with somebody. He hit mitts with two different coaches. He like... Um, he made himself throw up. Like, not sticking a finger down his throat, but just Who from breathing. Who was he fighting in his last fight here? I don't remember his last fight. Was that it, though? No, I it think. was when he fought Reyes. Oh, okay. And he was like doing breathing exercises Sheesh. and then he like threw up this beet juice and I, he was like throwing up right next to me. And I remember kind of turning away to like give him some privacy. And he was like laughing at me. He was like, oh, what? You never seen somebody throw up before? <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. But that's his process, you know. And yeah. and I don't know how long it took him to discover that. But it was really cool to watch. That's it cool. was really fucking cool, like super powerful to be yeah, a part of. Yeah, I bet. And to be like, damn, like he's the fucking champ. He's the, the goat. Best ever. And this is like what his process is. Yeah. And now my process 
because of my experience is like in the locker room we go so light hell i do yeah. a lot of breathing exercises and i break a sweat hell yeah and that's kind of it and so it and it, it showed is. in your fights it Dude, showed you had good energy yeah, yeah. i lo- and i love the process again i love the process like i love to be there i just feel so happy like yeah through the through the whole camp and everything so His last fight was Reyes. Then who did he fight in Houston? So, yep, here's the fucking flyweight. Yeah. Jessica Andrade, number one. Caitlin Chukagin, number mm-hmm. two. And then Lauren, number three. Boom. Damn, that's so badass. I know, dude. and it's so cool that it's all happened in the last year and a half. Oh, my you God. You know what I mean? Because literally I <laughs> was, like, not even uh, in the top ten, you know? Yeah. And then it's we so and we worked our way up the rankings fair and square, which I really like. Like I beat number twelve, then I beat number seven or eight, and then it was number five. And you know what I mean, like. Go to uh, Lauren's record real quick, Jay. Sure. Um, yeah, sure, dog. Or... Yeah, that's fucking badass shit. Cause it was this, not this fight. The fight before you got the bonus too, huh? I haven't gotten a bonus. That, well, when you finished that bitch, I thought you did. And I wish. You didn't yeah. get one for that, huh? Neither me nor Scott did. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because right. we both got really good finishes that night and had really good fights. And like, uh, Or maybe Scott didn't get a finish, but it was a really exciting fight. I can't remember, yeah. but both of us were hoping for bonuses. <laughs> yeah, so that's a fucking... Could you even uh, take a, sh- a screenshot of that on the yeah. Mac so we could put that up when it's up? But yeah, you fought all the the baddest bitches. I know. I'd some maybe someday I'll fight Sajara again, but she's such a bitch. Like she just makes the whole like process of having a fight with her just awful. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, ah, no thanks. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but speaking of that, like I apologize and I shouldn't have asked that about Megan Anderson because everyone's freaking out about that. Yeah. And I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. But the reason I ask that is because Casey's five foot and she's like six two, so it just looks funny because she's so tall. Yeah. But I don't think they're thinking I asked it because of that. So they're thinking I was being mean, which I wasn't. Yeah. No, I, I understand, and I, I like, I, I'm a pretty big feminist. I think everybody yeah. kind of fucking knows that. And but I've tried hard in the last year to really try to see stuff from other points of view. So, like. You guys have to understand, you got to talk about people like they're right here with you, yeah. you know, and you have to realize that women are tired of fucking being talked about like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, no woman wants to hear herself be graded, uh, yeah. be graded like on a scale of one to 10. Yeah, for sure. No woman wants to be talked about being a 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or <laughs> that like, was me. that I, was me. I know that wasn't you, but it's like no woman wants to like hear that about themselves. Even, yeah, for even, sure. if, even if you had said like. Um, yeah, she's super hot. Like, I wonder, I, I I wonder totally if that would have been whatever. different, though. I, I don't know. I, I think it still would have made her really uncomfortable. Maybe. Really? Yeah. With the picture she's posted? Yeah, because now she what? She's going to go share a card with Casey Kenny, and she's yeah. got to act like she's happy to meet him after he just talked about whether or not he'd fuck her? Yeah, true. Come true. on. No, no woman. No and woman that was really my fault for putting, like that, putting him but, in that situation. It was just popping up. It was just being myself, I guess. So, but then what, what we all need to realize is that, like, one you do view it as harmless like it might it might not be a harmless comment Mm -hmm. but in your heart you are a good person and you're not trying to hurt people and i think that is a really important thing that we all need to realize because it's like okay what would you do like just from the way i think about i'm like what would i do with max if he made a shitty comment and i know in his heart that he's not a shitty person yeah but he made a comment and have I ever done that? Like, well, 100% yeah. I have fucking done that. Max has made shitty comments uh, yeah. that I didn't like. And it's just a little, you just have to be like, hey, man, that's not cool. Yeah, like, you and don't I shouldn't talk have like said that. that for sure. And I've had to tell him, like, you don't talk to your mom like that. You yeah. don't say those things to your mom. Those are things you say to your buddies by by yourself. Yeah. And well, anything that's going to make someone feel bad, that is not what I want to do. No. So and there's I enough think, motherfuckers out there that do that. Yeah. And I think people that know you know that. Yeah. The people on Twitter don't know that. And it's very easy for everybody on Twitter to just gang up on somebody and go, oh, you're a piece of shit. And it's like, they don't, literally, somebody on Twitter wrote to me like two days ago and called me a vile piece of shit. And then uh, <laughs> in the same hour, somebody wrote to me on Instagram and told them I inspire them. Yeah. And I'm like, neither one of these people really know me, yeah. you know? Which, yeah. And t- it feels good to be told I inspire somebody. I didn't like being called a vile mm. piece of shit. But at the end of the day, it's people that really, truly don't know me. Yeah. You know? So. It's crazy those people just love to comment their fucking two cents. One of the guys that was on your case about it, talking about feminism and fucking how it's so wrong to talk like that, literally told me that same day to shut up and be grateful that I have things to have taken from me. So a lot of these people are also not very self-aware. Yeah. <laughs> so. I literally don't read. I, I click my mentions and don't read any of them. 
None of Fuck, them. Man. No fucking way. I'm gonna go, like let my mental energy get used up by this. Yeah. Like, I, no way. I want to. I want to hear people's opinions. Yeah. I want to hear how people think. I think, and part the part of doing that has helped me like understand like okay, comments like this are not from a bad person. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then it, listening to other people's opinions and how they think, it's like I'm usually pretty liberal. But I have to respect the fact that people that, you know, lean to the right really feel that way. And they have reasons for feeling that way. Do you know what I mean? And the sooner I can get on board with that, I think the sooner I'm going to be able to have peace in my life. Yeah. Well, I always like thinking if I was raised exactly how they were raised in their body, I would probably be the same way. Yeah. So it's like I think that that's, you know, pretty, pretty true. So Yeah. Great. Yeah. So do you still do some meditation? What's your Mm -hmm. like practice like? I try to do 10 minutes in the morning. I... I'm not, I fucking suck at it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not yeah. great at meditating. But still, 10 minutes but, in the morning is more than people think. Like, dude, it's still hard to do that. It's hard to do. And then this year, I really want to get better at doing my breathing exercises in the morning. I do oh, them yeah. for fight camp. Mm-hmm. I do them, especially in the locker room and during fight week, we make a big deal of breathing exercises. But I'd like to get better about doing that on the daily this Fuck year. Fuck yeah. Um, but yeah, because meditation has changed my life. You were l- learning about it, I think, almost, I don't know if it was before I was, because when I was living with you guys, When I stayed with you guys for that month or those two months, I don't think I was started to meditate yet. I think it was when I fucking broke my jaw and then tore my bicep where I started learning about it. Mariah was kind of mentioning it to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then where where did you start to learn about it? After the ultimate fighter. Cause, and, but I think that's what it takes for people. Some hard experience that they're having a hard time dealing with. And then you find meditation or you find or something religion. that helps you or religion yeah. or marriage maybe or, yeah, like, yeah. or a 12-step program or whatever it is but yeah that's like, true yeah but a bunch of people were like hey man you seem really stressed have you thought about meditating and i was like no <laughs> you know what are you talking about i didn't see how it was going to help and then um, yeah. i just tried it like the way you try anything i'm like okay i'll give it a fucking couple days well, like you start with headspace mm-hmm. yeah i still use headspace quite a bit i oh, like yeah. um i like waking up um what's that guy's name sam, sam harris yeah sam harris yeah I like waking up. The headspace, uh, I like that guy's voice. That's like, he's a super soothing voice. Mm-hmm. And I like that there's different styles of meditation and you can do whatever works for yeah. you. But just taking a step back and noticing the way I think about stuff has been wild to me. It's a pretty wild fucking ride. I feel like it's been a big catalyst in why I've changed so much the last Hell couple yeah. years. Because I'm sure just all the shit you've been through, all the like, even the drug addicts you've been around, like, I'm sure what automatically comes to your mind when someone does something is like almost not hateful shit, but almost like, Oh, there's an issue with that. But meditation is like almost, you catch it before you're like, Oh, that's maybe my old self. And that's not me anymore. I'm look at this a different point of view. Yeah. It's given me a lot of room to look at stuff with a different point of view. But, um, I, a lot of my go-to is like real negative shit. Like, or like I'm a know-it-all, you know, that's one thing I kind of realized through meditation is that I'm always like, oh yeah, they asked me a question. I must have an answer. And sometimes it's okay to just be like, yeah, I don't know the I answer to that. I don't fucking know, yeah. for sure. <laughs> so I, I, there's just stuff that I've realized about myself. And uh, did how much yeah. of it was like probably weed or mushrooms too, along with meditation that helped with that kind of stuff? Who, who could say? Do you do mushrooms at all? Have you? I've microdosed. Um, yeah, I've microdosed quite a bit. Um, you, I don't take I don't take like mushroom trips very like too too often, but yeah. I do microdose like fairly regularly. Um, I grew my own mushrooms last year, which was a yeah. cool process. Yeah. That well, those those some some I ate some of those and they were really good. Oh, cool! Yeah, I'm really glad you liked them. Yeah. I almost I thought I thought I sent you guys something when I was feeling those, <laughs> but I was like I loved them. Oh, cool! Yeah. So yeah. was it a hard process growing them or not? Not really. Mm-hmm. Pretty easy. Yeah, huh? any idiot can do it. That's fucking yeah. sweet. Any monkey. That's really that's really sweet. Yeah. I think it's cool they started this on Netflix this show the guide to Oh yeah, did you see oh, that? Oh yeah, I saw that they did uh put something out on Netflix, but that's that's sweet because I'm like telling people I know now. I'm like, "Hey, have you ever thought about meditating? <laughs> have you ever thought about trying meditation?" And most people will do it like just during a hard time or they'll get upset and they'll go, "Okay, I'm going to go meditate." And I'm like, "Fuck, how do you meditate when you're upset?" I can't. <laughs> I'm yeah. like Ah, fuck I was it. just yeah. trying to follow your breath and stuff, but it's like the meditation, it's not, not a thing you can do for a week and really f- start seeing real benefits. It's You got to do this for months it's and then you'll regular. be like, holy, now I kind of see what people are talking about a little bit. Taking a step back and just not let my reactions 
my normal reactions take over. I can sit here when those reactions come into my head, I can decide whether I want to let them out or not, like, yeah. or rewire them. It's a fucking powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. Especially really for is. fighters. Dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy how much it's helped me. It's crazy how beneficial it is. And like, like I said, I'm not even a great meditator. Mm -hmm. Like I miss out on a lot of days. I meditated this morning, but um, one thing I like about Headspace is that it keeps you kind of accountable. It'll count how many days you've done in a row. Mm -hmm. And man, mine's at zero a lot. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And like, like uh, fuck. The 10 minute timer, sometimes I don't even make it through the 10 minutes because I'm just so like, mm -hmm. and that's in the morning before I even have a chance to get my day going. But I've noticed um, like, um, I wake up in the morning with my head racing a lot, mm -hmm. and that's part of why I don't sleep well also. And so meditation has helped with that minimally Man, so far. For, for a fight though, like having those kind of tools to just follow your breath, to kind of bring you into the moment, from the f for a fight when you're getting ready to it, I feel, or jujitsu too, I feel like it's such a big tool. Because it's, you can, before yeah. the fight, before Jiu-Jitsu match, you can freak the fuck. You can lose that fucking fight or match before you even go out there. Yeah, I've done that. When I fought Liz Carmouche, I was in the back having a meltdown before we walked out. And then after the fight, uh, the fight was terrible. It was super boring. And I was mm -hmm. like... Just tense. Was tense, afraid to engage, like thinking about whether or not I'm going to win or lose. The whole time. And then we went in the back and I was sobbing. I was throwing shit. I was like inconsolable. I was, I mean, I was having a fucking meltdown. Uh -huh. And um, like Crouch and Joe and Randy was there and like they were like, like none of them knew what to do. And even before the fight, I was like freaking out, shaking, just saying dumb shit, like uh -huh. super excited. Um, all over the place, yeah. you know, and I think I went to the bathroom and like, I think I was crying even before the fight. I mean, you've seen fighters do it. Dude. You've seen fighters lose it before even having a match. And I remember like, uh, I just knew they thought I was so weird. Like Crouch and Joe and Randy were like, holy shit. And then that added to the fucking yeah. stress of me being like, oh, they think oh, I'm for sure. fucking crazy. And then I had a terrible fight and then I was freaking out in the back, you know, how yeah. much would it have helped when I fought Roxanne? Actually, the last four fights I've had, but when I fought Roxanne, we did the breathing exercises in the back, and that was a hard weight cut to fight Roxy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did the breathing exercises in the back. I know now how to like sit very still. I know to like follow my breath through my nose into my chest, expand my stomach. We go through a series of different breathing cadences. Um, like I have all my memories to draw on now from mm -hmm. the fight with Sajara and the, the fight with Liz and all that, and I can remember what that felt like. And then we walk out to the cage. I'm breathing the whole time like box breathing. And then I like to do this when I'm standing in the cage. Um, like I'll find something on the turnstile, like a letter mm -hmm. or something to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I'll just look at it like, like I've never seen it before. I'll be like, ah, oh, shit. Like, like really study the color, mm -hmm. the angles of the lines. And uh, just for like, it could only be for like five seconds, you mm -hmm. know, but it really puts me in the moment. So oh, yeah. I like that little, it's a little meditation trick that I just really, really like. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've Cause did you learn that from Dr. Jim Aframo? You know, I don't know where I picked it up. I do, the fight with Roxy was one of the first time. Actually, I think I learned it on Headspace. Sometimes really? those Damn. like the they have one of those series for competition, mm -hmm. and that's one of the tools in competition. Now that you have me thinking about it, that competition uh, 10, 10 episodes thing that you do mm -hmm. for, on Headspace, it's one of the things they'll tell you to do is find a spot somewhere and just focus on it. Damn, that's pretty cool. Cause like, Greg Jackson gave me that same exact advice. Um, he said John Jones does that. He gets in the cage, he finds something, and does the exact same thing. That's so that's cool. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it really, really helped, especially for that fight. And then I turned around and I looked at Roxanne, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm fucking ready to go." Hell yeah! So even like, how much has meditation improved your and Joe's relationship? Immeasurably. I mean, we always had a really good relationship. Yeah. Joe and I, since the day we met, have been like super close. Yeah. Even when I was crazy, like he's he can deal with you better than anyone. Fuck, he's so patient. Yeah. He's so patient, and he like loves me no matter what. I don't know why. <laughs> like, he does. He just loves me no matter what. And, yeah. Like, uh, he lets me be crazy without judging me, and um, we have a really good time together. I make him laugh all the time. I yeah. know that's part of why he loves me is because I can make him laugh just hysterically. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um. Me meditating, though, and being able to just kind of focus on my own faults mm. has helped our relationship. <laughs> Obviously, anybody that does that is going to find benefit in their relationship. For real. You know, so. well, especially reading books and stuff and not like constantly blaming your partner and saying, that's your fault that I'm feeling this way. That's your fault that I'm feeling this way. It's like, 
I love going to Joe and I love asking him like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Tell me like what your point of view is or tell me like where I'm wrong. Tell me yeah. like something outside of my own view because this is all I can see. And I love it because he's so measured and intelligent and like he's got reasons for why he thinks the things that he thinks. And so I can hear him really well. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. It's fucking awesome that you guys have that. And I'm, I'm just pumped to see because before some of the fights being around you and being with you i felt bad for a little bit bad for not obviously you because you lost the fight but joe too i'm like god poor motherfucker's gonna live with this now for weeks but then seeing all your guys success in texas i'm like fucking yeah. worked out so good <laughs> we call it i know i told him this the other day like when when me and joe met i was like a fucking i was a fuck up man i was yeah. a drug addict i was drunk i was bad drunk it was kind of a piece of shit. Like, I wasn't a great fucking person, a role model. And I was like, babe, that's what we call getting a good return on your investment. <laughs> like, <laughs> Dude, he stuck real. it out and now we're doing it. But, like, we never fought. Like, he never treated me badly. So, yeah, that's fucking um, awesome. I guess he, he was like, he, and I, he laughed, but he was like, man, I've just always loved you. I've always yeah. Loved you. yeah. That's fucking so. sweet. What are we at for time, Jay? We're at 50 minutes. That's perfect right there. Well, thanks so much for coming and fucking chatting. The people are probably going to love this. So Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Fucking, I love following you and Suge's journey. Yeah. Because it's been cool knowing, like, since the, you know, since I first got to the lab, me and Suge got to the lab at about the same time, and then meeting you and, like, just watching your guys' journey mm. together and separate, really. It's yeah. Just, it's been inspiring for me, too, you know. It's been Fuck a big yeah. part of my journey. So Hell, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel like when people bring up, like, tim welch or something i'm like fucking ride or die yeah Dude, thanks so much <laughs> that's what it is that's awesome all right guys that's episode two peace